Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my week seven part one video. Um, and in this portion of this week's video, I want to talk with you about the elements of poetry because we're be beginning um, our, our new unit on poetry. Um, and I know that that sort of strikes fear into some of your hearts, but it'll be okay. So to follow along with me, go to content on the top of our course page and then to course documents. You'll have to click load more and then click on the elements of poetry. So uh, poetry is characterized by the presence of imagination, emotion, universal truth and we've talked about that before in our unit on fiction so uh, with with literature um, writers are trying to impart a message that reaches everyone something universal that that pretty much everyone in the world can relate to in some way and with poetry sensory impression is also really important so um, reaching the reader through his or her senses sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. And poetry, of course, is expressed rhythmically. All good poetry has a sense of rhythm to it. In fact, all good writing has a sense of rhythm, and usually with an orderly arrangement of its parts. So a poem will express within itself a sense of unity, sort of an organic wholeness, and it's written with the main purpose of providing aesthetic and emotional pleasure and our response. Um, so here are some well-known definitions by famous writers. Poe said it's the rhythmical creation of beauty. I really like that. Wordsworth said it's the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. And Arnold called it a criticism of life. I like that one a lot too. Carlyle called it musical thought, which I think is beautiful. Hunt said it's the utterance of a passion for truth, beauty, and power. And Shelley said it's the record of the best and happiest moments of the best and happiest minds. However, it's also sometimes the record of the worst and most unhappy moments of some of the best and most richly human minds, not always happy minds, right? We have this, t this tendency, I think, to think of uh, poetry as being, um, you know, all about roses and lollipops, and, and it, it isn't, um, as we'll see. It can be about depression. It can be about tragedy uh, just as much as it can be about something that's happy. So we have to kind of prepare ourselves for that. So um, if you remember when we entered into our unit on fiction, we talked about the elements of fiction. And now we're going to talk about the elements of poetry. And a lot of these ideas are gonna come back to haunt you in quizzes, they're gonna come back to haunt you in, um, certainly on that exam on literary terms that comes on toward the end of the semester. And when we reach that point, of course, I'll be reviewing with you so that you'll know exactly which of these ideas might come back and haunt you on that exam. But um, that's why it's a good idea to, uh, to pay attention here. We know that all writers use imagery, and, and that's, that refers to words that call on our senses, uh, as I just said. And of course, um, poetry seems to use imagery perhaps in a more profound way than any other form of literature. A good poem is going to set forth an exact original image. And um, another element may be an analogy, and that just refers to an extended comparison. So uh, like an entire poem may be a metaphor for something where um, one thing is standing in to represent another thing. Personification, um, and I think that we probably reviewed this earlier in our um, unit on uh, fiction, perhaps, because it's also a technique that fiction writers might use, but we would see it certainly more so in poetry. So this, is, this, this idea refers to um, a situation where an object or an animal or even an idea is portrayed like a real human being as having human traits. So for example, on Princess Fufu's Facebook page, check it out, Princess Fufu, two words, F-O-O-F-O-O, -O -O, 
Um, I personify her. Get it? Um, yes, I personify her, and I make her seem like uh, an animal who has a lot of human traits. And actually, I believe she does have a lot of human traits, but I personify her. You may not know that there's this whole underworld of crazy cat people on Facebook, and I'm one of them. Um, but anyway, check out her page and check out the About section. Most people don't look at the About section and they're not aware of all the, the many accomplishments that Her Majesty has made within her short lifespan. So that's personification. Animism um, is, is a similar idea uh, and technique that poets might use. It gives life to objects that are inanimate. So an example would be the fog comes on little cat feet. So obviously the fog is, is not um, something that's alive, but we, uh, we give it life. Now, when you see that word apostrophe, we think of grammar. We think of um, adding the little mark that shows ownership or possession. But when we're talking about elements of poetry and a technique that, that a poet might use, this term actually means the act of addressing someone who isn't present or something that is non-human. And the example that I give is blow winds and crack your cheeks. Um, sorry, that's kind of a lame example, but <laughs> it was late at night when I did this. Um, so that's apostrophe in poetry. Rhyme, we know of course, is the repetition of similar or identical sounds. And there are two kinds of rhyme. And this is absolutely gonna come back and haunt you, so pay attention to this. There's a true rhyme which is an exact rhyme, and there's a slant rhyme, which is a close rhyme, but it may not be an identical sound. So an example of true rhyme would be day and way. An example of slant rhyme would be move and love. Hear how they sound kind of alike, but they're not identical. If we wanted to make a true rhyme, we'd say move and groove, or love and above. So uh, those are the two kinds of rhyme that you might see in a poem. And all of this gives you something to write about in paper two, which we're gonna talk about in part two of this week's video. Um, but you can write about uh, you know, all of these techniques, these elements that you may see the poet using. And um, if a poem has no rhyme, then we say that it's written in free verse. There's also internal rhyme, so words within one line that actually rhyme with each other. And then there's the technique of alliteration, so that's the repetition of similar sounds. I just did it with similar sounds, the S sound, at the beginning of words. Another example would be uh, Langston Hughes' famous poem, A Dream Deferred. We hear the repetition of the D sound at the beginning of both those words that are back to back, so that's alliteration. And you'll probably see that in a lot of the poems that we read. There's assonance. Uh, that's a similar internal vowel sound, like scream and beach. Hear the E sound. And then there's consonants, similar internal consonant sounds, like leaves and lives. And then there's cacophony, and that's a harsh, non-harmonious sound, often produced by the use of hard consonants. So. When you, when you hear that word cacophony, and it might haunt you on the exam on literary terms, um, think about this little story. So I'll tell you a story from East Ridge. Um, so when I was growing up in East Ridge at my little church, um, we had an interesting cast of characters, and I write about them in the book that I'm currently working on, East Ridge's Eden. Um, and, and so uh, we had a choir director and his name was Brother Woody. And Brother Woody uh, didn't have any actual formal musical training. And so when Brother Woody would get up to direct the music, um, he would do this. It was like he was washing an imaginary window. So when he wanted you to go faster, he'd do this. And when he wanted you to slow down, he'd do this. And then we had Miss Eva, who was our lead soprano, and as my dad used to say, she couldn't carry a tune in a lard bucket. And so she was about this much off pitch with everyone else. And then we had um, my Aunt Alice Marie on the piano, and we had another little lady on the organ. 
And my Aunt Alice Marie uh, did, did not like to play minor chords. She just didn't like them. She felt that they were kind of depressing sounding. Uh, however, the organist was all about playing them. So anytime we had a song like We Three Kings at Christmas time where you had a lot of minor chords, um, you had uh, Alice Marie refusing to play the minors, you had the organist playing the minors, you had Brother Woody and you had Miss Eva like that much off, it was utter cacophony. The opposite of that is euphony and that's language that sounds harmon harmonious. And uh, then there's onomatopoeia. It's just fun to say that, just onomatopoeia, just say it. I mean, it's just fun. And those are words that sound like what the word means. And an example would be hiss, bang, pop. So these are just a few techniques uh, that, that might make up some of the poems that we look at. There are many, many more actually. But these are, are some of the main ones that you might see. And, and when you're writing paper two, you can use these terms um, in your writing to actually refer to the techniques that your poet is using. And of course, meter and rhythm. We've said, you know, rhythm is very important to the success of a, a good poem. So uh, we know that a syllable is any part, uh, any word or part of a word produced in speech by one breath. That's the formal definition. But in poetry, we have accented syllables, the syllable that's stressed, and, and then uh, we can mark those. So we use that diagonal mark um, over a word to mark the accented syllables, and then we use a little lowercase u over uh, a, a word to mark the unaccented syllable. And uh, the, the process of marking the syllables is called scansion. Um, so, um, a foot in, in a poem is the basic rhythmic unit of verse. It normally consists of one unaccented, or I'm sorry, one accented syllable and one or two unaccented syllables. And a line of poetry will consist of one or more feet, right? Um, and so scansion, again, is the process of discovering uh, the dominant rhythm in a poem and marking the accented and unaccented syllables and marking the end of each line and figuring out how many feet are in a line and things like that. Now, we are not going to actually engage in that process in this class. Some of you may have done that in high school classes where you looked at poems, but you do need to know, um, you know some of this terminology for the exam on literary terms. Scansion isn't an exact science, so you and I might scan the same poem and we might do it just a little bit differently, but generally, if we're doing it correctly, we're gonna be on the same page. So there are different kinds of feet in a poem, and so there's iambic, today. See how the accent is on the second syllable, day? And so if we were going to scan that, uh, we would have a little lowercase u over the two part, and over the day, we would have that little diagonal mark. Um, trochaic, daily. Now see, that's the opposite of iambic because the accent is on the first syllable, daily. Anapestic is another type of foot. Intervene. So now we have three syllables with the accent on the third syllable. And then dactylic, yesterday. That's sort of the opposite of anapestic where we have three syllables with the accent on the first one. So I won't expect you to, uh, to memorize you know, those types of feet, but again, these are all things that you could, if you wished, talk about in your poem that you're going to write about. So the process of scansion, if we were gonna scan a poem, would include marking, as I just said, those accented and unaccent unaccented uh, syllables, Identifying the foot, is it iambic, trochaic, anapestic, dactylic? Um, counting the number of feet in each line and identifying the line, where the line ends. And, um, and so remember, again, scansion isn't an exact science. It's just one way of describing the poem's rhythm and also perfect regularity of rhythm is not necessarily a requirement in judging the quality of a poem. So a poem may have a perfect rhyme, da 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 But that doesn't mean necessarily that it is a good quality poem. It may be um, a very poor quality poem, 
my husband writes poems for me. <laughs> but it's the thought that counts, right? Um, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> okay, so that is scansion. Um, symbolism. So we know that a symbol is an image that stands in for something else. It, it represents something else. So it suggests two or more simultaneous levels of meaning. So two, two different meanings that are happening at the same time. And there are different kinds of symbols that we'll see in poetry. This again gives you something else to write about in paper two. So a universal symbol is one where the associations are commonplace enough that um, they're considered universal. Pretty much everybody all over the world would relate to them in some way. So an example of that might be the weather. So if you have a poem that's talking about gray skies or cloudiness, you know, or rain or something like that, the symbol of that, um, the idea that, that that grayness and that cloudiness and that rain stands in maybe for sadness for a dark time in life. That's going to be commonplace enough that pretty much everyone is going to get that. And other examples might be numbers. You know, certain numbers might um, universally sort of represent certain ideas. Um, there, there are cultural symbols where the associations are commonplace enough to a particular culture or group. And the example, of, a good example of that would be a flag. So. I know when I was in Ireland, I spent one summer there uh, doing a study abroad some years ago. And I remember um, when I first got there, I thought, wow, this place is great, you know, because everybody's going out to the pubs and everybody's um, singing and swaying and, you know, they're so happy. And I thought, wow, this is awesome. And then after I had been there a couple of weeks, I was thinking, the American in me started coming out and I was thinking, now wait a minute here, you know, uh, don't you people ever do anything other than just drink? Don't you work? Um, don't you <laughs> have goals in life? And of course, there are many Irish people who, who do have goals in life, but, um, <laughs> and who do work, obviously. But uh, that American in me, that, that Puritan work ethic started coming out and I started getting a little bit annoyed with all the, the drinking and the happiness and the partying. And I remember <clears throat> going to the Phoenix Park in downtown Dublin and that is where the, the um, United States ambassador to Ireland lives. His home was there. And for the first time since I had been there, I saw the American flag waving in the breeze and it had an effect on me that I that I wasn't quite expecting uh, uh, such a profound effect. I, I was just like, oh, the American flag, you know. I, I just had that moment of intense um, patriotism when I saw that symbol. Um, a contextual symbol is one where the associations derive meaning within the context of a specific work. So an example might be the apple uh, from the Genesis story in the Bible. Pretty much everyone who, who has any familiarity with uh, the Bible or with the story of, of Eden is going to know about that apple in the story and kind of what it represents. Uh, and that eating the apple represents the, the fall of humankind and it represents the idea of going from not having any knowledge of good and evil to having eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Numbers can hold meaning. So zero, eternity, because it's like a never-ending number. One might represent unity or divinity. Two, marriage, or the opposite side of that, conflict. Um, three, life and death, struggle, the solution of conflict. Four, earth, the elements, the seasons, the order. Of things um, we know there are four seasons and and in Native American literature four is considered a sacred number uh, for most Westerners uh, like us three would be a sacred number and if you ask yourself well, why might that be it's because of that idea of the Holy Trinity that's sort of embedded into our consciousness Father Son and Holy Spirit right three the three in one um, Five might represent human beings, senses, justice. Six, creation and the soul. Seven, order, harmony, mystery. Seven is sort of 
traditionally a mysterious number. Eight, again, a never-ending sort of number. Eternity, regeneration. Nine, perfection and truth. And 10, completion and a return to unity. So if you see numbers being used in a poem, there might be more to that than what lies on the surface. And then colors have uh, underlying meanings that are symbolic. So note that there will be um, two different sides to each coin, if you will. So white might represent innocence and purity and light. It might also represent something like ghost or something that is pallid and death-like, right, and fading. Um, so there's, there's a positive connotation and there's a negative connotation. Um, so always be thinking about the connotative meaning of every word in the poem. Uh, I think I said before on, on an, in an earlier video, um, pretty much every word in every language has connotative meanings except for words like the or and, you know, or something like that. But pretty much every other word has associations that come along with it that uh, carry more layers of meaning other than just the denotative dictionary meaning. And those terms, denotative, connotative, you know, you, you will need to know that for that exam on literary terms. The color yellow might represent sun, wisdom, light. Again, it could also represent cowardice. So have you ever heard someone called a yellow-bellied coward? Um, red, be careful with this one because, you know, so, <laughs> So, um, you know, in a, in a positive way, it might represent passion, and in a negative way, it might represent blood or war or a temper. They say that we redheads have a temper. We do not. We don't. Don't ask my husband. He'll disagree. Purple might represent royalty and martyrdom. It also might represent a bruise, you know, in a sort of in the negative connotative sense. Gray could represent age or death or winter or wisdom. Black, darkness um, or death. It could also, with a positive connotative meaning, represent determination, mystery, you know, the calm of, of night. Um, blue, sky, truth, purity, wisdom, but then sadness, blue. Green, fruitfulness, but also jealousy and envy. You've heard the saying, green with envy. So there are a lot of other common symbols you'll see used in, in poetry. Uh, water, again, could represent purity, birth, baptism, but it also might represent a force that could overtake us and consume us and drown us. Um, the sea, spiritual mystery, rebirth, the unconscious, again, but also a, a great force of which we might be afraid. The rising sun. So if, if a poem is set at the beginning of day, it might represent a new beginning, enlightenment, birth. And then the setting sun uh, might be just the opposite, the death of something, the ending of something. A circle, uh, the idea of something circular in a poem might represent wholeness, unity, fusion. Wind might represent the spirit, the soul, inspiration. A garden, in a poem, so a poem set in a garden might represent paradise, innocence, or fertility, um, or again, a beginning of something like Eden. Um, Freudian symbols, so males might be represented with extended objects like knives, swords, and spears, and females with concave objects like caves, rooms, and bowls. And always when I'm teaching an on-ground class, I'll have a couple of young men who will, you know, find that to be quite funny. So, eh, you know, what are you going to do? Um, so, so again, denotation, connotation, very important concept for us to grasp because you've got to know it on that exam on literary terms. So, so think, when you think denotation, think dictionary, right? That's an easy way to remember it. So a word's denotation or denotative meaning is its literal dictionary definition, what it would mean if you looked it up in the dictionary. But its connotation or connotative meaning refers to a, the set of associations and the emotional undertones, sort of all the baggage for, for good or for ill, if you will, that that word carries with it. 
And the first task, the first task in understanding a poem, remember this, is to thoroughly consider every single word in it. What is the literal meaning of every word? But what's the connotative meaning of every word? Because many words will have multiple and even conflicting connotations, as we've just seen. So structure and form in poetry, and we'll be talking about this um, more in depth in our discussion boards when we look at internal structure and external structure. And again, this all gives you a great deal to write about um, in, your, in your paper. So the poem might be what we call a narrative poem, which concentrates on action and the telling of a story. So an example of a narrative poem might be an epic poem or a ballad. Um, it might be dramatic. Um, in terms of the form. So it may be concentrating on dialogue, um, or it may be presenting a scene or a series of scenes. And so an example would be a dramatic monologue where someone is speaking in a very dramatic way, like in a play. Um, the structure could be lyric, and that's also called descriptive or expository. And it's characterized by a preoccupation with emotions, ideas, and the poet's state of mind. So you know, you're, you're, not, you're not really telling a story, but it's all about how the narrator is feeling at that moment and the ideas in the narrator's mind, the state of mind. And then another idea that will come back to haunt you on the um, exam on literary terms is a sonnet. And, and so a sonnet consists of 14 lines of iambic pentameter. You need to know that. And there are two kinds. There's the Italian, also called the Petrarchan sonnet, and there's the English, also called the Shakespearean sonnet. So those are just a few of the elements of poetry and ideas that you can use um, in paper two. And in part two of this video, I'll be introducing the paper two assignment sheet. Thanks for listening.